having the opportunity to sit with the people that have encouraged us and inspired us, one person really stuck out for me. And one person I wanted to make sure I had access to was the one and only Frank Shankwitz. Now, those of you who don't know his name, you do know the industry he started. Put your hands together for the founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Frank Shankwitz. Come on up, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. I tip my hat to you. Thank you. Thank you. You were a police officer for how many years? 40 years. 40 years. You just retired? Just retired. As a detective? Yes, homicide detective. But did you ever think that you would have started one of the largest nonprofits the world's ever seen? No. <laughs> <You're> no. <laughs> and, and tell us real quick the story of how it came to be. In 1980, I was a motorcycle officer, Arizona Highway Patrol. And at that time, the TV show Chips was very popular. We were told of a little seven-year-old boy named Chris. Chris had leukemia. Chris only had a couple weeks to live. And the only thing that got Chris through his days was watching Chips. They had arranged in his hospital room for a VCR so he could watch the programs over and over. He just loved Chips. And he told his mother, when I grow up, I'm going to be a highway patrol motorcycle officer. I was introduced to Chris, and I, he asked if we can do something special as doctors and his mom. Yes, we can. With the permission of our commanders, we set up a special day for Chris. He was picked up in our highway patrol helicopter at his hospital, flown to our headquarters building. And when they landed, I expected, I was standing by with my motorcycle. When they landed, I expect our paramedics to help this little boy out of the helicopter. Instead, here comes this seven-year-old bundle of energy just running over, high five, hi, I'm Chris. And he was so awed because our motorcycles, our uniforms outside of say in Arizona were exactly like chips. As far as he was concerned, he was, I was very red hair and very tan at the time, so I could have been Ponch and John, either one. <laughs> but he was just fascinated by this. And, and this little wish of his was becoming true. And I'm watching him, and I knew he was very ill, but he's bouncing around like a typical seven-year-old. I'm looking at his mother, and, and she has just got tears in her eyes because she has her little boy back, her little seven-year-old boy having fun. Chris went on that day to become the first and only uh, child to become an honorary highway patrolman to the day in the history of the Arizona Highway Patrol. We presented him with a badge. We presented him with a smoky hat and he went toured our, our armory. He just had a great day and his doctor was with him. And in fact, he was so having so much fun, so pumped up, the doctor told his mother, take him home. He doesn't have to go back to the hospital. Let him go home. And Chris went home that night. But we realized that we have now a highway patrolman. He has a hat, he has a badge, but doesn't have a uniform. We went to uniform shop in those days that were custom made and we asked the seamstress, can you maybe make, we have this boy seven years old, this high, this wide, can you make a uniform? They spent all night making a little uniform for Chris. The next morning, again, with permission of our commanders, I led a group out to his house, uh, several motorcycles, squad cars, sirens going, you can imagine the neighbors, right? <laughs> and Chris comes running out, and we hand him the uniform, and he is just, just ecstatic. He runs inside, gets it all dressed up, puts on a smoky hat, and he is just comes out, just look at me, I'm just proud as can be. But he came over to me and he was fascinated by the wings that we wear, motorcycle officers, and he said, but how do I become a motorcycle officer like you and Ponch and John? And I was just saying, well, Chris, this is the testing we do, and we go, ah, da, 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 and if only you had a motorcycle, we could test you right here. Chris was a step ahead of me. He ran in the house and came riding out with a little battery-operated motorcycle that his mother had got for him in place of a wheelchair. We set up traffic cones in the driveway, and he had a helmet that he put on, and in fact, he had put on what we call mucking boots. They were rubber boots that looked like our motorcycle boots, and very seriously went through these cones with his little motorcycle. He came over there and he said, did I pass? I said, yes, you did pass, Chris. Am I going to be a motorcycle officer? Yes, you are, Chris. And the wings, again, were custom ordered. They just couldn't buy them off the shelf. And again, he got to stay home that night. I called the jeweler and the same thing. We've got this little boy. We need some wings. He spent all night 
casting those wings. The next morning, I get a call. The wings are ready. I went to pick them up. I get another call. Chris is in a hospital, in a coma. He's not going to survive the day. Went to the hospital. His uniform is hanging right by the bed. Just as I pinned on the wings, Chris came out of the coma. He looked at me. He said, am I a motorcycle officer now? Yes, you are, Chris. He just started smiling and laughing. He started talking to his mom. He had the greatest couple of hours, and then he passed away. I always help think maybe those wings helped carry him to heaven. We learned Chris was going to be buried in Illinois. I was asked if I would go back with another officer and give Chris a police funeral. We had lost a fellow officer, which we did. And en route, we were met by Illinois State Police, we were met by the county police, we were met by city police. We had a full procession for Chris. Chris was buried in uniform. His grave marker reads, Chris Gracious, Arizona Trooper. But coming back from Illinois, we had so much response, so much press coverage, and thinking about his mother, how she, happy she was, and I kept thinking, we let him make a wish, and we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? And right at that time, and this is 33 years ago, that's when the idea was born, the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Let's let them make a wish, and we're going to make it happen. Since that time, because of one little boy, that's now 300,000 children worldwide have received the wish. And when you get an average of four in a family, that's well over a million people that have been impacted just because of one little boy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. When things were the tightest, when things were rough, and why didn't you quit? It, it never dawned on me to quit, and especially I had a coordinator that I hired to, or not hire, but volunteered to go to the hospitals and learn if there were other children. And every time I thought about quitting, because I'm still working full time, in fact, I'm working other jobs like most police officers have to do, and she would come back and she'd say, Frank, there's a seven-year-old boy that's in the hospital. He would be a perfect candidate. Frank, I just met this little girl. We've got to get this foundation going. Mm. So when money started coming in to the foundation, there was some success going on. Uh, you decided never to take a penny. Now, it would have been very easy for you to draw a salary. It would be very easy for you to, to have dipped into that well. Why didn't you? I had a job. I was a police officer. I had a job. And I, the people that started, again, working for us, but volunteers, I told them and our board members, we are not going to take any money. 100% of donations are going to go to this charity. Uh, I wanted it built on integrity. I wanted it built on character. And that group that I finally found, and it took a while to find those four other people, they finally, it all worked together. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Frank Shankwitz. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.